I'm going to now introduce Michael Lechman for the first talk. Michael is an extraordinary, generous friend of this school. Uh, as principal of Diamond and Schmidt Architects, he was born and educated in Montreal, and he studied architecture at the University of Toronto. On graduation, he joined Diamond and Schmidt and was named principal in 2003. And he's recognized for providing design leadership on complex institutional projects. He has shaped critical debate as the vice chair of Toronto's design review panel, and he contributes to design education as guest critic, lecturer, and mentor at schools of architecture. And his photography is quite extraordinary and has a wide following in parallel. He's been the project principal for some of the very finest buildings in Canada. They include New Brunswick, Ontario, Alberta, British Columbia, New Mexico. New Mexico is not in Canada. It's also a profoundly fine building. Um, and his list of key assignments include the Band Centre uh, at the University of Toronto, which many, many of you may, may know uh, just to, on, on St. George, the York University Student Centre, the Esplanade in Medicine Hat, the Algonquin Centre for Construction Excellence, and the Centre for Green Cities at the Brickworks, at the Don Valley Brickworks. And currently he's working on the Brock School of Fine and Performing Arts, as well as trades and technology schools in Lethbridge and Kelowna. Um, I can't resist a, a personal comment, which is that Michael taught me to draw um, and uh, was one of my very first mentors, and I, I owe a, a profound depth of, uh, of, of gratitude to you for, for your vision and craft and sheer enthusiasm for architecture. Welcome, Michael. Good morning, and thanks, Philip. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of a meandering context from, it's really a love letter to the city of Toronto. Um, I walk the city of Toronto every day, uh, a neighborhood in the city of Toronto, the neighborhood that you see in this photograph, the foreground of it. Um, and I uh, work in the city of Toronto. I advise the city of Toronto uh, on uh, the, the emerging densities in the downtown. And the city of Toronto is a, is a chaos of dreams. Uh, each neighborhood very precisely articulating a dream and then the dream evolving a little bit and becoming uh, adjacent to yet another dream. Sometimes those dreams change over centuries and sometimes they change over decades. And what we're seeing right now, witnessing right now in the city of Toronto is a change happening over years. Um, there's a very precise dream being prescribed, being defined by the building types that are dominating the city of Toronto right now. Uh, they are deeply embedded in the history of Toronto, strangely enough, though they may not look like it. They, uh, they, are, they borrow bits and pieces from all over the world, just as all of our building types have done. And they're creating something which we're seeing emerge and we have no idea what future it's going to bring. Um, but there are aspects of it actually, which despite all of the, the news that you may hear and the reports that you may hear, are actually have, tr actually have transformed Toronto into a place which it never dreamed it could be and is actually better than it ever thought it could be, interestingly enough. I live in a high in a tall building. And um, I can tell you that I didn't expect to live in a tall building. I, there were many illusions uh, and stories and mythologies of living in tall buildings. Um, I have more neighbors living in a tall building than I, do, than I did when I lived on the ground. I have a, a, a wonderful urban life. And I can tell you that waking up to this every morning um, uh, is pretty hard to compare with living in, on the ground. I have lived on the ground. I've lived on a laneway um, in this heritage uh, fabric of the city of Toronto. In the center of that dot is an 1880s house, a row house in, in, uh, in the South Annex, so-called. I've lived here in a laneway in Kensington Market 
in an experimental house, which could be the subject of an hour-long talk on its own, um, uh, which I'd be happy to give, um, designed by the former director of the School of Architecture at University of Toronto, uh, who in 1984 uh, dreamed of, a, of, an, of an urban future of intensification of laneways only and of uh, energy responsible buildings and an architecture of craft. And by the way, this was my walk home every day. This is a laneway in the city of Toronto. It's not the city of Toronto that you may be familiar with. I'm also currently living here and this was a dream put forward in the 80s, in the sorry, late 70s and early 80s, and I'll explain to you how it got to be so, but that's where I live. And you can see that this tall building, about 21 stories in height, and I live on the 14th floor, is complemented with two and a half acres of open space at grade, which at the time didn't seem like a very big deal. But in 2014, I defy you in the entire city of Toronto to find another recent project that has taken so seriously the need for open space at grade and density. So what was a second class project um, for a while became, strangely enough, a first class project when all the adjacent buildings in the downtown discovered that they got great views and they have great balconies, but they didn't have access to open space at grade. So this is a remarkable project for that reason. Again, just another teaser in November uh, when we have the great storms, this is what it looks like when I have dinner. <laughs> um, so there's some context. Now you know a little bit about me. I'm going to circle around a little bit and say that in about 1919, so nearly 100 years ago, the vision for living in an urban circumstance was being taken on by people like you, just a little bit older than you, in this case by a watchmaker, who thought living downtown could be fantastic. It could be the best experience you could have. And um, uh, he imagined that there was no reason that de high density living could be any different than uh, living uh, on the ground. And so he proposed as part of, a, of an architecture exhibit, um, uh, first of all, a, a vision for the city, and secondly, this, what we would be in, in today's term, uh, idea of a balcony in a condominium. This is the balcony. This is the living room and dining room. Those are the living spaces behind. And this is the upper floor. Bedrooms, playroom, exercise room, overlook to below. This is the entire apartment. Imagine a conceiving of the best possible way to live in the city, a place to, to enjoy green, a, a place to entertain, uh, a place to relax, a place to play, um, and then multiplying it. So having the dream and multiplying it. Imagining um, beyond that garden that, that I was just showing you, that you might also want to reach out beyond the building face and enjoy a view up and down a street. And then, in a very generic way, without suggesting that it be uh, the, the end solution of a particular investigation, suggesting that it could create uh, streets as well as open space at grade. 1921. Think about what you imagine 1921 to, to be. <laughs> um, uh, looking back on, on the city of Toronto in 1921, any great city you've been, and, and, and imagine that someone is trying to reshape our perception of living in the city by um, first imagining the unit itself. Right? Pretty interesting. Now this project, these units, this design was considered to be a crime by the local establishment at the time. Um, he was, this person, this watchmaker, was reviled by, uh, for having made this design. And uh, his proposals for the city of Paris at the time were considered to be um, uh, 
as, as close to, 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 to heresy, beyond heresy, um, as you could possibly imagine. How, at that time, this could have been seen that way is very hard to imagine. Certainly looking back on it now from 2014, um, it just doesn't seem to be too criminal to me. And just to, put a, to, to sharpen his, uh, the vision, he, um, uh, he and his group um, decided to promote this idea by actually building an example of this way of living in an exhibition. So here's a view of the garden uh, looking one way, and here's a view of, the, uh, of it looking the other way. So our view, our, our view of living in the cities was forever changed in, with controversy and with possibility by this watchmaker's sketch and belief that there was a way to actually enjoy living in the city. I'm calling him the watchmaker because I don't want to say his name. <laughs> and um, uh, if you know the, the, uh, the exposition in 1921, which you can Google right now on your computers, you'll know who I'm talking about. He later became, it's a test. Uh, he, and his ability to look at human possibilities for living in the city or the country um, and for bringing together the modern possibilities in architecture and current construction techniques really did profoundly affect the way that we live and, 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 and perceive the city now. So as I mentioned, so I'm going to be putting out some threads. I'm, I hope that I'll, you'll believe that I can tie them together uh, as we get closer to the end. Um, so tr Toronto, most cities are laboratories of ideas. They're laboratories of dreams. And if you're lucky enough, if you're Paris in 1850, um, or you're um, a city in, in, the 16, in, in, in Italy in the 15 or 1600s, they're all built with the same dream. So everything looks the same, six or seven stories high, or one or two stories high. Um, if you're in a city that's, whose dream is changing because technology and possibilities are changing nearly every decade, then you have these, these dreams adjacent to each other um, and they, they begin to look like chaos. So think about Paris between 1830 and 1890, New York 1830 to 1890, and Toronto 1880 to 1910. They're all being built at these scales. Um, one of the, I showed this photo at the beginning, one of the things about Toronto is that it was built largely between about 1880 and 1920 at two stories with a tree, a front garden, and a back garden as the dream. So we really, those of us who are lucky enough to live in Toronto, live in a forest that happens to be traversed by streets and has houses in it. But it is a forest. And if you are on the sixth floor, fifth floor of any building in Toronto, you'll see that it is a forest. You can't even see the houses in the middle of the summer. It's remarkable. Um, of course, where density increases, that relationship between green space and built changes. And you can see in the center of this photograph um, that in the center of the city, and this is only about three years ago, um, it's changed considerably even since then, you can see that that balance changes. But it's a remarkable thing. This is not empty. This is not devoid of construction. That's filled with houses. And the other part about Toronto, which is remarkable, is that we have this amazing resource, which is the Toronto Islands. You don't often see it in the foreground like this. This is taken from, with an iPhone from a Porter flight going to, to Ottawa. But every city needs to be, it, it helps. And one of the things that underlies this presentation of context that I'm giving you is understanding a, the place of invention. If you understand, if you can try to understand where your city has been, what the context is, where it's going, you can be better equipped as visionaries, if you're lucky, um, to find a place of invention in your project that's appropriate to where you're building. And that's part of the reason for giving you this little bit of context in Toronto. So keep an eye as we go through this next series of slides on the ratio of green to gray. Um, this is the, 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 um, the default, I guess you could call it, pattern of building in downtown Toronto. 
There's a main street up here. There's another main street down there. And there are these long blocks between them. And not far away, um, a, a fairly generous park. Just imagine what the ratio is, for instance, of the individuals uh, uh, in, um, of, of green space for, w within each individual home and garden, and then the overall ratio of green space between these homes and this shared park. Just keep that in mind. It's not an easy number to come up with, but just look at that ratio. It's a very successful neighborhood from a planning point of view. Architecturally, these neighborhoods are just okay. But from a planning point of view, the livability of these neighborhoods is second to none, frankly. This is downtown Toronto, second to none. The reason that there is a condo boom in Toronto is because of these neighborhoods establishing a, a livable city. And they're borrowing from that livable city that's already established. And the livable city is made by this incredible parent pattern, which is commercial development and commercial uses, public uses on the main streets and those main streets um, being different than the residential streets in between. This is Paris. Uh, notice the ratio of green to gray. Um, and there it is in plan. There's no green within the blocks themselves. All the green is on the street where, where it can grow in the seven story, seven story city. Um, this is a three to five story low rise New York City. Just keep in mind the previous balance, previous balance that I showed you. And this is this, the New York City, the Manhattan that we associate. This is the 10 to 20 story New York City. Where's the green? Well, the green is Central Park it, or, or, or neighborhood parks, but it's not here. This is a pretty big slice of city. You can just see there's one tiny spot, the upper right corner, right there. Yeah, a tree. That's a very different experience of the city. Obviously, this is not an unsuccessful city, but it's interesting that the balance that has been struck over the history of development of Toronto includes um, uh, an understanding and appreciation for open space at grade. So Toronto is built with this superstructure of highways and parkways, this armature of main streets, the, the protected realm of the residential streets, and the support spaces of laneways. And you sh I showed you a laneway. This, no doubt, I, 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 that you've seen these, the two documents that I'm going to show you in a minute, um, the uh, Mid-Rise and Avenues Guidelines for the City of Toronto and the Tall Buildings Guidelines for the City of Toronto. They're documents that are loved and loathed uh, by, by developers in the profession. Um, they're loathed because they limit. Um, those who love them see them as being a, a consolidation of everything that's been learned about the city of Toronto informed by the quote that Philip gave you at the beginning of the talk, which is learning about the city and appreciating the city through the eyes of Jane Jacobs. So this document is a consolidation of all of that. Imagine that. And what you see in this document is, a, is an indication of where its expected density is going to go on avenues. So, you, so um, uh, Bloor Street, um, uh, King Street, um, and I think your site is right about, let's see, right about here. Um, this is an idea that density can go in main streets where transit already exists, and it can be used to reinforce the transit network, reinforce the density of cities without jeopardizing those neighborhoods that I showed you. So it's protecting the neighborhoods. You'll notice there's a big gap in the middle. The big gap in the middle is where the rules about density because of economic pressure are very different. So what I've shown you is that there's, there's been over a century of adaptation of all sorts of building types in the downtown. Um, and that in the area, and including the area where you are considering, we are still learning. So you've got 110 years of experience and about 10 years of experience. And we're still developing what these building types should be, can be, what the life in those areas can be.
So there's a very specialized building type that has emerged. And if you, I'm not going to go over it in detail, but if you have read the tall buildings guidelines, if you've looked at the case studies in the tall buildings guidelines, and you've done the same in the mid-rise and avenues, you'll see that there is a very mature understanding of urban living and a very mature um, uh, response to climate and street making and sky view and light access and all those things. The, the, built, the building form that is meant to represent those is something that I hope that you can understand and then innovate with. But my premise always in this case is to make sure you understand because there's a whole lot of knowledge embedded in those two documents and in the building types that are emerging that need to be taken forward when one explores other options. I should mention that this is a competition that for a building in uh, Regent Park uh, that we lost. Um, and this was about 30 seconds before uh, I put the model in a box and drove in a, in a car across town from Jack Shimoniak's office, a model builder, all the way to the, west end, the east end of town at Regent Park. And those are all the model builder's hands finishing the last pieces of the model, which were five minutes ago all laid out on the, on the bottom, uh, on, the, on the pieces of paper next to it, which freaked me out and I was, I was going to have a heart attack. Um, um, successful main streets are not an accident. And one of the things that is, is, uh, that is very strong in Toronto has been our two-story high main street. We, um, it's interesting that when, when, uh, when you have the change, the radical change between summer and winter light, um, as we do in Toronto, as you do here, that um, it's remarkable that you can get light on the north side of a street when the, store, when the street is a two-story high street. And when you go to the street that is being projected now, as a one-to-one -one street, um, a, a cross-section where the street width and the, and the building heights on either side are the same. And it's something that has had um, a kind of a, a special, um, um, what's the word, uh, special importance in, in planners' minds. The, the interesting outcome of that is for about four months or five months of the year, there's no light on the north side of the street. So this success, this livability of, our, of, of the city of Toronto and the two-story street um, is now going to be replaced by this. And we're going to have to learn to work with that or maybe innovate so that there are ways of getting light in the six-story or seven-story or eight-story street that, that, uh, that uh, will get us light on the north side of the street that we didn't have before. So imagine, if again, I'm hoping uh, that you've had a chance, and if you don't do it with this project on this term, that you do later, find a chance to read the mid-rise and avenues guidelines. They talk about light access as a critical piece of the design of the streets and avenues in Toronto. And here's an important street, College Street, and there's a 20 meter wide street in the city of Toronto. So you can imagine one-to-one -one buildings on either side in order to maintain that the um, that one-to-one -one cross section that's in the tall buildings and uh, the uh, avenues and mid-rise guidelines, you would have a 20 meter high street. Here, Spadina Avenue, 30 meter high street. Here, the Esplanade between Sherburne and Berkeley, uh, downtown, a 60 meter wide street, 60 meter tall buildings on either side. It's a street with a park, yeah. So uh, the reason for showing you those is to to let you know that, that certain aspects of liv livability are, are happy accidents in our northern climate. And um, sometimes you can design uh, things that don't recognize happy accidents. Um, but I ask you to just consider that, to consider light access as one of those that's made Toronto a very livable city. In the context of 2014, it's impossible to imagine that there was a time when a mayor and the councillors, out of fear that building tall buildings in the downtown wasn't properly understood, banned towers. You could not build a tower in the downtown. 
Can you imagine that? <laughs> it's impossible to conceive of. It's impossible to imagine that a, a mayor could have the vision to say, based on what we're hearing from Jane Jacobs, because that's literally what was going on, <laughs> we don't know that what we're doing with all these towers is better than what we had before. We don't know. So based on we don't know, <laughs> accepted that there could be a ban. Incredible. I just, it makes, I just... Now, imagine that um, uh, what was going on was that single-family homes were being torn down and they were being replaced with towers in the residential neighborhoods, in those pockets that I'm telling you, the new mid-rise and avenues guidelines, the new tall buildings guidelines are meant to protect. There should be, based on these guidelines, no buildings built in the same locations as these tall buildings were back in the 60s. That's part of the reason they're doing that. Um, so I, 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 if you re remember nothing else from this talk, remember that something that you and I can be complicit with in the development of the city can actually create social failure. We did that. Not they did that. We did that. It's interesting to keep in mind these, the, the happy accidents, the, the insight and the wisdom of those like Jane Jacobs and others to keep us mindful of the impact that we can have as, as, as architects. This is April 1973. I show you this photograph because uh, I, I had someone doing some research for me, and um, this was a student in her office, and she said, I recognize the folding of hands behind that person. Could that possibly be someone we know? And that person is Jack Diamond, and he's just leaving a, a demonstration to oppose the demolition of houses and to replace them with towers. And uh, someone who, uh, this, the founder of my firm, uh, who was an activist all the way through the 70s and late 60s, um, trying to make sure that there was a, a, um, a good understanding of the making of cities and that we were making our cities on good principles. So the response to the banning of towers was to try to find some other building type to use. Where to go? Well, Europe has successful streets. Let's imitate Europe. How does Europe make streets? Well, they make them with super blocks. They build up the edges and leave the, em the middles empty. So let's give that a try. Um, in, from 80 to 90, uh, in addition to the super block strategy, uh, people were thinking, well, we just need to fill up all those laneways with houses and we can probably get the density to be uh, higher without building towers. So the house that, I'm li that I showed you that I lived in was a response to that. Oh, yeah, you could live in a laneway. Um, those things were all going perfectly well, and then, the, then uh, 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 a, um, there was a financial crisis that hit in 1991. And um, all construction, all economic activity stopped. And in a hope to bring economic activity forward, Mayor Barbara Hall proposed that um, all zoning guidelines uh, be relaxed, not eliminated, but relaxed, and um, that it be experimented in an area called the Kings. And the result of that was an instantaneous response by the development community, leapt on it, and started building immediately, and the building construction boom has not stopped since. So 96 to 2014, since the relaxation. And since that time, the City of Toronto has been trying to catch up with what the development community and architects have been trying to, to do. And with that period of time, as uh, density has gone up, so too have land prices, and so they're chasing each other across the city. Um, it's interesting to, to reflect on what we were doing in the 60s, we, the design profession. We were trying to, uh, we had an ideal about access to light, green space, the commonality, of open space, um, we had a very interesting, different view of the street. The street was considered to be tyrannical. You should not make streets. There should be one common open plain that buildings stood on and that everything else should belong to everybody. Pretty idealistic view, right? 
Um, so when you see the towers in the park that are the that are heritage from the 60s, think of that as one, an incredibly powerful political statement being made by architects and planners that open space should belong to everyone. We're at the other end of the spectrum now in 2014. Any site that any project has, you included, and the assumption is that you build out to the edges of the site, you fill it up, and um, the street is the public realm that should be created. It's very interesting. Interesting to see it in contrast. The one that we're doing right now has huge advantage. I can tell you from where I live at King and Bathurst, the way that the city has evolved in the last 10 years is great. King and Bathurst to King and Spadina is one of the great pieces of city street in all of Canada, possibly North America, maybe beyond. It's wonderful. <laughs> it is true. You want to know how a main street works with density, that's where you go. We've created a building type that has serious energy questions. And not very many of us are willing to take them on very seriously. Here we go. So I'm going to race through these next few slides. So there you know, there's the 1880s to 1950 housing stock. This was the house that all that housing stock was built on, thanks to Lorna Day. Uh, a colleague and friend and, and, and researcher who found this building type. This is, it comes from England. It was out of a catalog. Most of downtown Toronto was made with this house. Uh, there's this tower in the park. There's that common plane. Uh, not on a main street. Built in a residential neighborhood. Interesting to look at this uh, figure ground of towers in a park and try to imagine the street grid that goes along with it. It's hard to do because that wasn't the priority of this era of architecture. The era of architecture was making connected common plain, not streets. Just look at it. Where's the street? Right? If you take a figure ground of your buildings of the city of Toronto now, it's easy to find the street. You just can't see it in these at all. And it just underlies that the philosophical and political statements being made by these buildings back then that are very different than what we're making now. Um, there's a bit of a distortion here because actually, the, 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 from what I understand, the number of units, the number of buildings being built in the, early, in the 60s and 70s is greater than those now. It's just that the number of units are smaller now. And so the, it's the number of units that makes this, that distorts this. Because back in the 60s and 70s, you would never ever have built a 454 square foot apartment for anybody. You wouldn't have done it. You would have, you would have bottomed out at about 800 or 900 square feet. So in that same area, 900 square feet, you basically it's double. You can double the number of units. So look at that construction that's taking place. This, um, in the 1970s, in response to the banning of the towers, mixed height mixed uh, height, mixed income housing, and you can see it's kind of a super block. Um, there's my building again in the very middle of it. It's a super block, uh, but it has uh, a low front and a transitional area and, and open space at grade. So there you go. There's that reiteration. Barbara Hall's big gamble to save the city's economy change the, the zoning. Kind of amazing. And then this is the first stages of that change zoning in the downtown. This is um, uh, around the railway lands, but you can see the towers, the green space, the podia, and what that results in. It's interesting that it looks very, it looks one way from above street making in some areas, when it's been done well, has actually been quite successful. When the bottom piece, call it what you wish, the piece that can modify itself to suit local circumstance, when it's done right, it actually can do a pretty good job. I'm not going to read all this, only to say that what we're in the middle of is two opposing interesting forces. One of them is that we're in a gold rush right now. People are coming from all over the world to build in downtown Toronto. 
Um, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity. Um, it's it's an a, a opportunity for, for developers to make a massive profit. It's very successful. Um, but it's also a, a rare case where in our lifetime we're able to see a single building type be repeated um, and create an entire context in the way that we couldn't have if we were in Paris between 1830 and 1880 when it was happening there. So we're seeing that happen in our city now. There is a context and there are many reasons and as I mentioned about how dreams, um, the building of dreams actually coincides with um, a construction technique, there are many aspects of, of, of this new context that are based on the convergence of all these forces, concrete frames, certain kinds of windows, uh, underground parking, all those things are coming together to create this phenomena. And at about uh, 5.45 in the morning, this is also what it looks like from my window. It's a city of glass, right? Think of how many units and how many individual lives are represented by this one photograph in that view. Pretty, pretty fantastic. Um, energy efficiency. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I should spend much more time on it. The idea that this building type can be more efficient than a single family home should be true, isn't true yet. Imagine that. Not true yet. Um, a little bit of eye candy and then a, a summary. One of the things about the development of towers in the downtown, because the particular construction type because of the availability of particular windows, because of the zoning guidelines, because of parking, all the buildings look the same. Why do they look the same? It's all of those things. And because they look the same, you can think, well, that's what I've got to do, because it looks the same. And what I ask you to ask yourself is, the model for the buildings right now is a hotel room in the city. Now, I showed you a different model at the beginning of the presentation. Not a hotel room in the city, a home in the city. But the model is a hotel room in the city. Now, there are lots of definitions of hotel rooms. And if you haven't been in a condo showroom yet as part of your project, um, shame on you. But, you sh but if you haven't yet, you should find a way to go because you'll see that they're pretty, you know, pretty good hotel rooms. But what they're, they're not are buildings that are taking an other view of the priority of this building type. This is a building in, in, um, in Spain that... Um, that takes energy uh, conservation, the making of a skin, uh, it's not a condo, but the energy conservation, the making of a skin, to be a place of innovation in order to conserve energy. Um, these next several slides are houses and, and places where you can live that don't assume that the, the, the reference point is a hotel room. There's something else. They don't assume that you want, that in order to live properly you need uh, 22 feet wide and, or sorry, seven meters wide and three meters high of glass uh, of a view. Uh, I know I like my view very much, but they don't assume this as their premise. They assume that there are other possible ideas, other ways to live in the city, to access light, to create view. Um, and some, oh, almost 100 years later, have, this is visible from the High Line, uh, next time you visit, um, uh, where someone has created the most wonderful condos and porches and movable screens, possibly um, uh, dreaming in a way that the watchmaker dreamed a hundred years ago. So um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, I'm going to try to wrap up um, and just say that the, the idea of protecting the, um, the residential streets, um, of providing light access and view, of, of uh, recognizing how wonderful it can be to be in the city, and remembering that uh, this was called the Doomsday Toronto Diagram. You may have already seen it. It was someone saying, you know, if we leave the zoning the way that it is, Toronto could look like this. Um, and it was a drawing done by, I think,
think George Baird, um, back in about 1970 something. Um, and as it turns out, uh, it was based on that paradigm that I was explaining to you about the common, the, the common ground plane. Uh, on the story of scale of unit, you know, this is one scale, this is another. And if you really want to go small, uh, which is where we're headed, you can go very small. And this was a study done in a school of architecture uh, where a student was responding to a, a professor's request to optimize space. Um, um, and as you know, balconies can be um, uh, an, an idea of a balcony rather than the balcony itself and they can keep getting smaller or they can be part of a bigger vision of what it's like to be in the city. Um, if you have a QR reader, a QR code reader on your phone, take a picture of this now. Um, I ask you um, um, to uh, spend 48 minutes and 54 seconds approximately with a fellow called Jer Jeremy Rifkin. And uh, he will, uh, the first 10 minutes are a bit hard to watch because it's pretty gloomy, but he has a vision for the, the place of architects in the ability to change the world. And uh, he has five pillars of a third industrial revolution. And the second pillar is transform the entire building stock on every continent to micro power plants. So imagine that in all these other things which are political that you as architects have the possibility of becoming part of a transformative change away from fossil fuels. Five pillars of the third industrial revolution. I was fascinated by this project on Roosevelt Island which didn't have any green roofs. And it occurred to me after that they were thinking about buildings as micropower plants, not only as trying to control stormwater or manage uh, solar um, uh, heat island effect. So a watchmaker imagines urban life. A philosopher imagines a world without fossil fuels. And an architect tries to bring all that together. Thank you.